What is the chapter on one dimensional thought about? Aside from the title. Which chapter? The one we were reading for today. Okay, five through seven. Yeah, five, yeah. Second. What's he really talking about? Can you find a passage that will summarize or at least get close to what he's talking about? Yeah, I, well, I thought I found one. I thought that uh, Stanley, that it was the development of thought. I'm sorry? The development of thought or reason. And um, it's only four lines, but there's, there's probably a better passage, but this one is, I shall try to identify some of the main stages in the development what of this. Page, what page? Uh, 123, I think. The beginning, yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to read it. I shall try to identify some of the main stages in the development of this idea, the process by which logic became the logic of domination. Yeah. The logic of domination. There, there was also some. He seems, I, I agree with that. Um, he's talking about the formula, the, the methods of thought and concept formation. But I was, I was surprised that he focused so much on the concept of truth and the concept of reason. And here on page 129 in the middle, he defines truth just in a parenthetic clause. He says, so that truth, which is freedom from material necessities. Um, he makes a big distinction between the realm of necessity and the realm of freedom. And he seems to be saying here that truth and by corollary reason can only be measured when you're out of the realm of necessity. Is that important or is that just Very important. He, dumb? He's actually paraphrasing Engels who says that freedom will flourish only after the realm of necessity has been surpassed. We'll fight for freedom and we'll never win until we beat the system of capitalism. Um, freedom is the recognition and the transcendence of necessity. And, and, he, and throughout the entire chapter and the book itself, this chapter and the previous one, particularly the fifth chapter and the fourth one. Marcusa refers to a, the phrase that I mentioned last time of Marx. He refers to the, uh, to the concept that work, that work uh, for wages is a form of slavery in modern dress. And no matter how we are privileged in our particular uh, job, we're still working for someone else and following their, generally speaking, following their um, dictates. So then I have another question. Um, Marcuse is argues strenuously or appears to be strenuously opposed to what he calls the tyranny of facts. Other words he uses are positivism and bare empiricism. Could you draw the line between that and his system of thought? Yeah. Which I'm not connecting quite well in my system. Well, well, Kutz is implicit. You want, yeah. I just want to add to that, which I've been burning to ask you for a week. Why don't you believe in evidence? Why don't I believe in evidence? Right, which is related. He doesn't believe in evidence either. I, 
that. I'm glad you asked, asked that question. Does anybody want to try to explain, forget about whether you agree with him, what Marcuse is talking about when he says he does, he's not all that thrilled with evidence, with fact? Is part of it that the facts are like a grab bag of unrelated um, points in the universe, um, which are which, which we take unrelated to history or a historical flow or what he might call the totality That's or the correct. whole. Uh, but I still don't understand what I just said. <laughs> oh, I don't believe it, but yeah. that's all right. Um, anybody else? I can try. I, I don't sure. know if I understood it. Um, I, I, be I believe that he, uh, he's saying that uh, the hegemony of instrumental reason, it, it produced a, a, a world uh, in an understanding of the world that is a uh, is false. It's not. It's it's it's, it's not. It's a, a it's a appear, appearance appearance appearance. appearance. It's re, it's a real, not the truth. And so when we take facts, we are actually uh, uh, collecting uh, real, ideology, like real things. That's number one. Yeah. Say that again. So what we what we are told that like, the, the things that we collect as evidence. Is just uh, what is real for him, which is ideology, which is false consciousness, because uh, uh, instrumental reason has uh, been su has been subordinating subordinating the um, uh, what he calls eros eros, eros. eros. eros right, and he it breaks the relationship, the precarious relationship between eros and logos. And so we, we, we see things that are false, that are, are not real. The needs that we are sold are not real. I mean, they are real, but And, and we true. find it as an evidence. Yeah. And, but they are uh, real, but so, true. I, I, so I, I, the only way to say this is to impose my view, which is partly to get an argument going or whatever. So use a horrible example, Vietnam War. Uh, the, the, the Pentagon was collecting data about killing and gen its genocidal war and being very positivist, right? There's a lot of professionals and experts uh, uh, studying and analyzing and collecting data and telling the, and, and so <clears throat> the chain of command was, was going from Vietnam to the, to the Pentagon saying, we're winning the war, we're going great. The whole thing was a lie, the whole thing was false. What was, but it wasn't false because it, 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 it used evidence. It was false because it was racist. It was false because it was sexist. It was false because it was imperialist. And I would think Marcuse would agree. I just have a problem with saying all evidence is uh, to be, I don't know, suspect. I don't know how to say it. Of course all evidence is to be suspected, but we all have evidence. We all use facts in our everyday lives all the time. It's just that distortion is part of our mentality and our ideology and our culture as well. Well, the, 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 the argument really is that the Vietnam War was, from the United States perspective, one that was not genuinely in the interest of this country, or for that matter, in the interest of freedom. Uh, it was a war without end. Uh, but that was a speculation. Uh, that is not based, uh, I mean, there, and then the facts were marshaled retrospectively to show that that was the case, that the Vietnam War was false. Uh, um, there's a, a myth which continues to circulate in the United States. You may not have heard of it because you're all in New York, but it's around the world, it's around this country. The United States has never lost a war. That, of course, is patently untrue. When I say patently untrue, I mean there have been several wars of recent vintage that could be interpreted as U.S. losses, one of which is the Southeast Asian law, uh, war. Um, the Vietnamese, in the long run, had to go back to the U.S. and other 
Western powers for support because they couldn't support themselves without China and the Soviet Union. But in fact, the, the war itself was either inconclusive or the United States lost it and we withdrew. Uh, one of the facts that did not uh, rise to the surface about the Vietnam War is that is what the, how the war ended and why. One of the main reasons the war ended is because half of the U.S. officer corps was killed by soldiers who were ordered to go into battle. A huge uh, um, number of officers who gave orders to go into battle were murdered. That would have indicated a fact which was disguised, which is that the war, there were two wars going on, one against the Vietnamese and two, a civil war in the United States among the armed forces. And unless you ended that war, the armed forces were in trouble. Uh, which raises a fundamental problem, which is discussed only indirectly in this book. The fundamental problem is that war is the preoccupation of almost every state. It is the principle of government, and that war is conducted in the front line by the army, which has increasingly accumulated power, and in the case of Bolivia, enough power to rule the country, at least temporarily. The role of the army, which is allegedly supposed to be uh, allegedly subordinate to civilian command, um, by the executive branch primarily is almost never true. The army has its own independent uh, existence, its own sovereignty. And it does negotiate the sovereignty with the executive branch and hardly ever with Congress. Which now seems broken, at least And you look moment. in the New York Times almost any day and the uh, so-called intelligent media, like uh, National Public Radio <laughs> and television, <laughs> public broadcasting system. <laughs> if you look at their uh, at their uh, programming, both the Times and public television and radio, a lot of it is about war. A lot and and about the election, which is a, you might describe as a falsely reported fact. The, 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 the narrative of the election on its own level of appearance is not false, but it is, the, the presidential election is a context for people to take over at the level of appearance they're not going to ever get to reality, because if you try to get to reality, you'll find yourself six feet underground as present. It was the Bolivian army's uh, uh, benevolence that they told Evo to leave as a recommendation. Mm -hmm. And he signed his resignation right away, because he knew that it wasn't about it wasn't a recommendation. It, wasn't it was about you leave or else you're dead. Yeah. You know, okay. Somebody had their hand up. I wanted to. I wanted to know then, in consideration of what Eloy said, or maybe I'm asking you also to clarify, is part of what you're saying that each little factoid is not just an isolated piece of empirical truth, scientifically tested, but in fact is a repository of a, also a little piece of ideology that is within it, like a like. Like a seed. That's correct. That's what I understood. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question maybe for, yeah. uh, for you. just want to clarify one thing, uh, because are we talking about 
the way in which Marcuse marshals his own evidence or his persuasive arguments to make a point, and how he, because he's, you know, how he marshals evidence, or are we talking about the role of, of evidence or facts within capitalism? Because if you take law, for example, the evidence is always predetermined. There's a, something before the evidence is what is at stake. What are we trying to prove? And I think Marcuse is partly saying you cannot determine what constitutes evidence before we know what is at stake within the greater society, what capitalism, just like a legal trial, we may, uh, so therefore, we haven't got to that point. I don't think he's disputing empirical fact, but really disputing the way we evaluate the meaning or the state of the evidence. I think he's disputing empirical fact, right? except in the hard sciences. But mm. he, I, I, I think that, so I don't know if but I'm I, correct or not. Well, in his discussion of science, in this, Do you think in this that climate change is about hard science? Uh, no, I actually don't. <laughs> what is, what is the concepts that? What are the concepts which surround climate change addressing? Um, um, they're political. It's a question of the political mobilization, and where, what is that going to consist of? That's what An I think. Indeterminate. Future, right? That's Which right. are partly political and partly derived from some scientific speculation of the future. Um, the reason you can have, like in the United States and Western Europe generally, virtually indifference to climate change. Is connected to this book, and why? Uh, and why it's connected is that climate change cannot be established for people who do not experience any aspect of it as fact. You may find people in Mississippi, in Florida, especially in Florida, who might have be become convinced because of the flooding. But people in the rest of the country are passing resolutions and having conferences. They're not, they're not occupying either Washington or their state capital or, for that matter, their, their local uh, um, city, city about climate change because it is not a fact. It just isn't a fact. So, I mean, th that is the, okay, so th that question you asked is the key question. Is he against, is he, is he disputing evidence in general or facts in general? And I, and that's where I have a problem. Like, for example, I, I kind of want it both ways, right? I want to be constructionist and believe that ideology is so saturated in ideology. I would call it motivated reasoning. I would say it goes all the way down to the core of our being. We grow up in a culture that is teaching us to avoid facts and reality all the time. On the other hand, there is a reality separate from us. There are facts. You know, for example, I believe that more species are dying off more quickly now than they have in a long time. Because I've read that a bunch of times. 2.9 billion birds mm. yeah. since wow. 1970. Wow. 2.9, but they're not mm. all dying off. Nobody, <clears throat> when 2.9 billion birds are invoked, it's almost never explained even what they're talking about. Yeah. They're not simply talking about birds that have died of pollution or flooding or whatever in fact has happened, as it were, at the level of, of appearance. The 2.9 billion also refers to those species which are disappearing yeah. and are not in a position to be renewed, mm -hmm. which means that the birth rate is declining. And accumulating the decline, you can come up with a figure, but it requires an analysis of how species renew themselves, which is, a, which is both factual and speculative. Now, the point, the, the, the interesting thing about 
your son's name. His, his My brother. Say, that is Karl Marx. Is that his oh, yes. main criticism of Marx is that Marx not only examines from his own theoretical perspective the political economy of his time and tries to refute its major premises or seriously system, but also he is projecting a future. Um, it is not clear to me that the Western prejudice, which is based on appearance, that the proletariat is disappearing and is not clear to me that, uh, that is, unless you want to um, discount small country like China and a small country like India, the proletariat is not disappearing. It is shifting its location so that the United States, Britain, France, not so much Germany, but certainly Italy, are uh, beginning to resemble um, third world countries insofar as the only productive activities they have is um, uh, electronics and agriculture. And we used to have everything but electronics and agriculture as our pride. Can you imagine the uh, vacating of small number of uh, 750,000 General Motors um, production workers to its current number of 59,000? And it took place almost behind the backs of the experts, the economists didn't believe it, and they criticized me right. and Bill DeFazio right. for writing a book called The Job is Future, right. where we said that the production in this country is coming to an end in certain major areas, steel, auto, aluminum, textiles. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, a million textile workers, yeah. and now it's about 100,000. Uh, half a million garment workers, and now it's about 50,000. That, that is people who make coats and, and dresses and children's wear in the United States. Suits are a little bit different. But if you have a theoretical perspective, you can talk about the year 2100 and say it is likely that we're going to be under, that cities will be underwater. But you don't have a fact to prove it. You have a reading of a series of events and of tendencies in the, in the economy, in the uh, um, um, climate, and so on. Marx, Marx was inspired truly inspired by uh, Britain and didn't expect the Indians to ever develop uh, industrial base or certainly the Chinese. There's, no, there's remarks in his, in his writings about India and China, but particularly India, but most of it is about its colonial status. Um, the role of speculation, even among scientists, is very powerful today. But we are still attached to facts. Facts are ideological. That's obviously the point. Um, not only ideological because of their randomness and what you can make of a fact, that you discover in randomness. It's also, and this is what we raised in The Job is Future, and nobody's ever really commented on it. Science searches for facts that it chooses. It, in, some, in many respects, it ignores facts that it doesn't think are important. 
the net, of course, is a step of scientific ideology which has to be challenged. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we know, at least I know, that in the 19th century, and, and well into the 20th century, even today, um, various diseases which affect human beings and various conditions which affect human beings are attributable to gen genetics. And there's almost no conversation about the material context within which people develop or don't develop and civilizations develop or don't develop. But obviously, um, most diseases are social diseases. Historically, we do with social diseases whose manifestation, whose form of appearance can be traced to bacteria or what used to be called microbes. Somebody is dumb because they were born dumb. Somebody is not, not physically retarded, but somebody is slow because they were genetically impaired somehow. Goes all the way. X is brilliant because they were born brilliant. You're describing biological determinism. Biological I'm sorry? You're describing biological fetishism or determinism. Biological fetishism is what obviously is going on. Right. Yeah. Pervasively. Right. Even the left loves to quote facts. Yeah. Because it has no theory of human, as a, as, as a left, of human development. Page 138. But the real dividing line between pre-technological and technological rationality is not that between a society based on unfreedom and one based on freedom. Society still is organized in such a way that procuring the necessities of life constitutes the full-time and lifelong occupation of specific social classes, which are therefore unfree and prevented from a human existence. In this sense, the classical proposition according to which truth is incompatible with enslavement by socially necessary labor is still valid. There's not a single fact in that sentence. <laughs> no, it's two sentences, not one. <laughs> and yet we all know it's true. Okay, the source, what? They wanted to ask. Yes, I mean, with this, I'm always interested in this uh, the tension between positive and negative, and, and the idea of conveying the negative. But the way he describes it is that the negative sounds like something that's positive within the description of conveying the negative. And I think that so you know at a certain point earlier, I don't know if I have the right ed the edition you're reading, but same but but same edition. Yeah. So so the. And the stabilizing tendencies, this is 184, 124 in my edition. Page 24? 125, 124 in 124. my edition. The stabilizing, this is towards the end of the first paragraph. The stabilizing tendencies conflict with the subversive elements of reason. The power of the positive with that of negative thinking until the achievement of advanced industrial civilization led to the triumph of the one-dimensional reality overall contradiction. And that seems like a little bit of a thesis, I mean, in, in some ways. I mean, what's one dimensional is the, the, flat, the flattening out of the positive and the negative, the, the, the logos and the eros. Um, but subversive elements of the reason, of reason, I'm wondering what is he, why does he call that subversive? Versus if, if you're saying reason creates facts, well, a certain he talks about this throughout the book. Right. That re, that that reason. Well, there, there's there's uh, 
a valid reason and invalid reason. The invalid reason will uh, suggest form of rationality based on formal logic to a certain extent. Which, which he's right, using. Also based on negativity. Right. Which will pass as truth. But, but here's what you have to account for, Ben. In the United States, and increasingly in France and Britain, and certainly in Germany, uh, there isn't a single daily or weekly publication, not one, that I know of, that has any circulation whatsoever that is sold on newsstands. Mm -hmm. That goes deeply into the relationship between appearance and reality on a regular basis and uses the negativity of reason, which he discusses in six pages of his book, Reason and Revolution, right. in, the, in the new preface. Uh, not one. They're all descriptive of symptoms. Uh, of appearances. And you will find now the New York Times spares no effort to describe the depth uh, uh, in terms of human suffering of poverty over and over and over again. And not a single line will discuss poverty in terms of any historical evolution. Right. Any kind of social uh, class structure. Uh, the structural uh, explanation ha is declining. It's not dead, but it's declining very rapidly. And you will talk to your friends and they don't have a structural re uh, recognition. Is there a new working class in the United States? Yes, there is. And, and how is it constituted? And what, what are its functions is or should be the subject of serious scholarship. Instead, what the progressive, i.e. radical scholars are doing is studying Poverty in terms of numbers. Okay. The currency of the realm. I'm sorry? The currency of the realm. Yeah. But, but what, it, 128, I was very interested in the uh, discussion of slavery and freedom of thought. That was very, I mean, uh, you know, when he says the classical concept implies the proposition that freedom of thought and speech must remain a class privilege as long as enslavement prevails. And obviously, enslavement does prevail. So, is he saying that uh, we are all engaged in class privilege by having this conversation because somebody else is unfree? No, no, you're not. You're not free. I'm, I, I was not free uh, when I was uh, working, right, as, a, as an academic or working as a union organizer or working in a factory, I was not free. The other day I left the union meeting early. Sorry? I was free to leave. I was at the meeting, we did a vote, and then I said, well, this is great, I know where this is going, thank you very much, and well, I rode can, home. You can be free And I had leave. a beer on the way home. So it wasn't completely <laughs> unfree. I was not that beer is perfect, but I was able to get up this morning and ride over here to some the extent. The only form of participation right. in the... Um, form of social class rule that you and I have is the vote. Right. And what we are voting for is not what he calls reality, we are voting for appearance. And which doesn't mean that presidents and Congress have no power. It means that their power is severely limited right. and limited in such a way that it restricts knowledge and freedom. So, where is their negative thought versus positive? That's a, that that tension, and and so well, in, conveying in the biology, negative. Well, in biology, there were two guys. One of whom has now become a left liberal. The other of whom was genuinely 
interested in that in, in negative thought. Two guys who wrote a book called The Dialectical Biologist. Mm -hmm. And there were biologists who <coughs> began to explore the dialectical nature of biology um, in an organization called Science for the People. Yeah. Dick Levins died a Marxist, Richard Lewontin, or Dick Lewontin, is still alive and he writes for the New York Review of Books. You can't write for the New York Review of Books and talk about the fundamental social structure of even this country. You can't do it. The editors at the New York Review, the owners won't permit it. But <coughs> philosophy, he says, philosophy envisions the equality of man, but at the same time it submits to the factual denial of equality. What page are you on? I'm on page 129. 129. So there's this idea of equality, but there's a factual denial of equality yeah. at the same time, isn't it? So equality is an idea, I guess, but you're saying that we also have a in fact, there is a, we don't have denial. We don't, we don't have equality. We can talk about equality, but it's New an York, idea. The New York Times talked this morning about Michael Bloomberg spending $30 million, $30 million. next yeah. week. Or spend this, the money on housing. Beginning Monday yeah. on an ad campaign to start his presidential bid. What the story does is describe that he has $30 million to spend without being hurt by that number. Uh, but we don't know where the money comes from. We don't know how we acquired it. We don't understand why we have billionaires. We don't understand those things. People talk about breaking up the big corporations. This. Um, presidential candidate uh, named Elizabeth <laughs> Liz talks, talks about um, breaking up the big corporations but she never talks about the last time <coughs> that was tried. <coughs> you remember when it was tried? Um, early the in the 20th century. The antitrust stuff. Huh? Early in the 20th century. Not that early. early. Mm -hmm. The 30s or 40s with the antitrust breaking up the, the steel, the steel, the steel, the steel mills, the steel. Forties, I thought. What did they break? What did the steel, the steel. Oh, oh, Isn't the steel factory? The it steel. Broke, it's it's standard oil. Oh, yeah. standard oil, right? Oh, right. Oh, yeah. 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 So. <coughs> and Mobile had an Indiana and the one on the, the standard of, of, of uh, California had to be broken up. And they broke them up. Right. Which did what? Nothing. Do you ever go to, uh, do any of you drive? Have you driven in the last decade <laughs> into an American oil gas station? Sure. sure. That's the yeah. name of Standard of Indiana. Yeah. Huh? No. Where? Did you ask it? I'm not. I'm, I'm being provocative. I can't Did we ask that. ourselves the question, why it's now not Standard of Indiana anymore, American oil? Why SO and Mobile, which maintain separate labels, are really the same corporation? <coughs> They've been allowed to merge. Yeah. It was a temporary innovation that quickly got rescinded by the executive branch and ratified by Congress. The study of um, mergers and acquisitions is just beginning, but is it still understandable why Elizabeth Warren calls for breaking up corporations. I used to be very critical of Lenin's argument that 
the assembly line was a good idea because it disciplined workers to come to work on time. I still don't agree with it, but there is something to the refusal of the revolutionary or even the radical left to, to talk about breaking up corporations because within decades they merge again and doesn't and even when they were separate, Esso and Mobile and, and, and uh, Standard of Indiana uh, and uh, Standard of California, they met regularly. Yeah. By telephone, by email, by all kinds of subterfuges, by luncheons. And then labor historians, another example, never ask the question, why after the Flint sit-down strike in Chevrolet number four, um, in Chevrolet number four, did General Motors sit down with the UAW and give the entire chain of General Motors in the United States to the Union? To be, to be recognized. Why did that happen? They didn't want to repeat. They didn't want that to happen they again. Want, they wanted to they tamp down militants. That's right. And why did Ford refuse that model? Because Ford had a view that the union could be <coughs> held back right. from success if not infinitely, at least in their lifetime, that they could win, which in fact was true. Ford Motor Company got organized first in 1941 because the federal government ordered the, organiz the union organization. It was, it was a wartime expedient, mm -hmm. which Ford mm -hmm. lived to regret. But until then, from, nine, from the 1930s till 41, Ford was unorganizable. They could not be organized by the best of the UAW organizers on the one hand. On the other hand, General Motors could be organized because General Motors had a different strategy. It was a strategy of company unionism. And nobody who was in the labor establishment and the historical establishment will ever call UAW and GM a model company unionist for, for the 1940s onward. They took bonuses. They took long-term agreements. It was Walter Ruther who took the long-term agreement of five years for the first time. And I asked Nelson Lichtenstein, who wrote the book on Walter Rother, why that happened, and he shrugged his shoulders. He said that was so that there would be security for the union. Okay. I said that may be true, but it also tied workers' hands for five years, or four years, or three years, even. And he didn't say anything. Wow. So in other words, to defend a peak of, you, of union act, activism, you have to deny that it was controlled and tamed at the same time. The peak of union and act, activism was 1937. Okay. But, yeah. Then the hospital workers was the next peak. But industrial unionism did not invent anything new of any consequence after 1937. They signed contracts, and they waited for the next contract to get wage increases. And if they wanted to, if they were frustrated, they'd go on short-term wildcat strikes when either they were defeated or they would get a token increase and go back to work because they wouldn't get support of their union leadership. The leadership was always against wildcat strikes and would go around to the plants and actually advocate to the workers to not strike. We're not for strikes. This is not what our style is. We're for negotiations. Mm. 
Stanley, you've assigned this book a few times. Well, How many times do you think you've assigned this book? I didn't hear what you just said. This book, I've read this just like, I think, my second or third time yeah. going through this with you. And I get something new every time I read it. With you. Um, but I read it again this time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's so, so why, I mean, I think, what, are, what brings you back? I mean, I, you know, I, I have my reasons why. It's enough new for people who have not read this. Or, right. Or, or, or read it in the normal way, which is to skim. Right. There's enough new still to warrant a revisit. Mm -hmm. Besides in which, the Frankfurt School was a post marx version of Marxism. Right. Mm -hmm. And had been for years and years mm -hmm. attacked by Trotskyists and communists alike as being a bourgeois um, institute in Frankfurt, Germany, most of the time. Right. <clears throat> but if you read Adorno, which I do, you will discover his self-proclamation of being a Marxist. Right. And then you have to ask, why is it that they are still called, even after those statements, not Marxist? Mm -hmm. Anybody well, have any idea? Yeah, but because the, because the Frankfurt School was too pessimistic, right? The, the, the claim is that they were saying there's no way out. This is the, well, the that's dialectic. one reason. Right. The, I think the sort of orthodox Marxism went into economists. Uh, well, yeah. they were not orthodox. They didn't talk about political economy. They talked mm -hmm. about these superficial culture. things like culture, right. language, mm -hmm. things like that. Psychology, they right. were interested in Freud right. in psychoanalysis as a part of the analysis of the social reality. And that was a, a, uh, a sin. Yeah. Mm. What about poetry, though? What about poetry? Poetry? Yeah, doesn't poetry convey the negative? They didn't think that, yeah. did, I mean, did any of them read Patterson? It was, no, I mean, I wonder, because I, I think that, that the contradictions that we're talking about in this text, what? On paper. What? They never read Patterson. Because I, I, when I think about the contradictions between the, the essence and appearance, I do think poetry sometimes comes a little further. I mean, he's asking for it, but I think sometimes in some of the metaphysical poetry, we're there's getting a little a, closer to that. There's a dirty little secret about William Carlos Williams, the writer of... <laughs> I shudder to think a dirty book. Okay. There are quite a few. poem called Patterson. He was a materialist, yeah, and he was a dialectical materialist, right? And he was hanging out. He was anti-communist, and he was hanging out with people in the Partisan Review, which had gone beyond Marxism and gone beyond communism to reinvent liberalism. But he was not a liberal, hmm. and Patterson is a terrific poem, and right. it shows. <laughs> what poetry can do. And of course, Marcuse in this book mentions Baudelaire mm -hmm. yeah. and other poets, especially French poets. Well, I mean, especially in the chapter on language, the idea of, of the positivist language in J.L. Austin, everyday language, I think of someone like Paul Salon who after the war couldn't write in that way. But I, I, got, I, have, I have a question actually, if I could go back to yeah, the yeah, point yeah. you're making about freedom. Because recently I was kind of trying to struggle with this at a session on the idea of communism. That was at Columbia and we were reading things like Dijek and Bali Bar and this, and, and the issue of freedom came up quite a bit as the, the governing concept of communism, probably because of the ways in which communism has become Kind of tarnished because of the uh, history of the it's Soviet Union. It's always now pronounced with a capital C. Hmm? Communism. Yeah, capitalism is <laughs> a small C and a big C. in the Soviet Union. And exactly. Europe, so it's capitalism with a small C. And so this idea of freedom, and Peter Halbert says we have to go back to this idea of freedom. And so I think that complicates this book and the way in which, I mean, this idea of freedom, it did open up some questions for me about what that means if communism becomes somewhat indicative, you know, real, real representative of freedom, not in some simplistic way, but in 
a rethinking of what we mean by this. And I think you're raising it, you're raising it as well. Uh, yeah. The Frankfurt comment. School never talked about being socialist. Mm. Yeah, true. It was always communist. Mm -hmm. oh. With a small c. Yeah, yeah. small c. Yeah. And that's a small c, exactly. You have Super to differentiate. Important. Yeah. Right. It's important to differentiate. It is it's an important good. differentiation. Yeah. I mean, freedom, freedom of, is important. Freedom of thought is important. And it, although he says it's class privilege, and, I, and it, it sounds almost like a modern, you know, people throw the word privilege around lots these days. So but when he says it's a class privilege to think about freedom of thought, I mean. What is the origin of the term communism? Mm -hmm. what, what is the word of communism? Community. Community. Yeah. Yeah. Latin commune in common. Yeah. We have hundreds of community organizers in the United States who are not organizing communities. Except such things as the civil rights movement, uh, you know, and the women's movement, they organize a particular group, but they can't be communists. And the reason they can't be, I'm not talking about why psychologically they can't be communist, because to be communist would mean um, to recognize that the, the women's movement and the black freedom movement are moments. They are not states of reality. They, the state of reality is where men, women, lesbians, gays, transsexuals, workers, um, what we call professionals, but are qualified workers like doctors and so on, belong to the same um, political movement. Doctors today, 65% of them, they can only get jobs in hospitals and healthcare institutions. They can't really be petty bourgeois anymore, 35%, but that's declining. They have to be employees. They have to be workers. Proletarians, more. They have a moment of autonomy in the prescription that they give to patients, but they can't do it outside of the institution. They get a quarter of a million dollars, or three hundred thousand dollars sometimes, but they are restricted. They can't have a private office unless that private office is sanctioned by the administration of the institution, and often it is, but often it isn't as well. Social workers are almost entirely connected to institutions. Nurses have a certain number who are independent, but not that many. And teachers, I could make a living as an, as an independent teacher and have seminars with teachers and charge $85 a session. <laughs> That's true. And people would come to that. But who wants to do that? I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's honest. I guess I just have a quick question because I just was thinking through this. And when we talk about freedom in relationship to small city communism, in some ways it seems like we're, and this is totally speculative, we're establishing freedom as some sort of thing outside necessarily of the unfreedom of social relations and something ontological that communism today needs to work through because the old forms of communism based on social production and did not work. That, that sounds like it, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, that's just... Uh, some way of working through this. 
Well, it was not the only all form. The, the all forms of communism were not communism. Okay. The Soviet Union called itself the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics sure. in the USSR. Sure. And they never meant to be. Uh, Stalin declared Russia to be a communist society, but everybody laughed. It was not in Moscow. I mean, it was a joke uh, for the for the world because uh, the Soviet Union wasn't even socialist. True. True. They had workers' councils who didn't make any decisions except spontaneously. Mm. But the revival of the term communism is coincident with the revival of the, of the perspective of revolution. Which we discussed in the earlier part. To, to call oneself today revolutionary socialist is a contradiction in terms. <laughs> the socialist parties of the 20th century and the late 19th century explicitly uh, talked about the revolution in the far distant future and at the time were, were parliamentary socialists, social democrats, were electing socialist reformists, uh, members of Congress and Parliament in Germany especially, uh, with the hopes that one day they would be the majority. And Bernstein said, socialism will come to Germany in steps. Every reform will uh, gradually amount to socialism. And the communists always have disagreed with that. Rosa Luxemburg joined and functioned in the Social Democratic Party because it was a uh, diverse party. Its leadership was always reformist, but revolutionaries like Karl and Leibniz, and Karl Leibniz were permitted to teach and permitted to function mm. within their program. What I find amazing is that Luxembourg's writings are not widely disseminated in this country or I would think in almost any country anymore. Imagine members of the Democratic Socialists of America who sat down to read negatively. Not likely. Oh, when Tr uh, now Tronchi's book, whose negative teacher came out, Workers and Capital, will they sit down to read that? Will they have study groups? They have study groups on Michael Harrington. Mm -hmm. I wrote a book called Socialism. Mm -hmm. Former Trotskyist. What icon did... Um, Trotsky's named their children for. Lev Trotsky. It was not Leon Trotsky, it was Lev Trotsky. And I know a number of little children here in New York whose names is are Lev for that reason. Just wondering if your um, question had been satisfactorily answered about facts and empiricism. No. I it seemed to be still hanging. Yeah, I want to I want to come back to it, but I'm trying to pull back this. I want to okay. I want to talk. I'd love to return to that. What is still hanging about it? I I'm, I'm not satisfied about evidence and facts. I want to I want to duke it out with you and everybody else. 
Yeah, all right. Well, so, I mean, I don't know if Bring this is, it. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know if I'm off the Wolf Ride reading. I'm on page 140. And he's describing the difference between, I would say, positivism or one dimensional thought and dialectical thought. And and who is the huh? main source in ancient Greek philosophy for dialectical thought according to most Plato. 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 Okay, okay. Plato. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Socrates, Plato. The uh, quintessential reaction? Or? Yeah, right. Anyway, I'm in the middle of the page. In contrast, dialectical yeah. thought is and remains unscientific to the extent to which it is. It is such judgment, and the judgment is imposed upon dialectical thought by the nature of its object by its objectivity. I'm not sure what that means, but this object is the reality in its true concreteness. Dialectical logic precludes all abstraction. So, so I, I know that what he's saying here is that dialectics means looking at development, at change, at the, the whole, W-H-O-L-E. But, but what is the basis of change? What is the basis of change? Yeah. Contradiction. That will be apparent from your reading of this. Okay, book. okay. So, reality is contradiction. Okay. And labor. And contradictoriness <laughs> is not only endemic to the society, which you easily recognize, right? But is, in, but is a property of human development in general, including the development of each individual. We're all contradictory. Yes. What would what would be the um, the 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 signature um, attempt to live a contradictory existence? I'm I'm reading a book about Whitman right now, and one of the big tensions in the book, which is part of what you're talking about, is is. The, the author seems to be really shocked that Whitman worked. He flipped houses. He was involved in <laughs> involving building. In, no, no, seriously, like sure. fixing old houses yeah, yeah, and, and selling them. Yeah, and and, and, and it, himself with labor. Earlier? Yeah, it's like God forbid the guy had to had to work and wrote poems. Right. You know, when he had you know time outside. I mean, in T. S. Eliot worked a lot. You know, in the insurance company. So we're good people. You know, I'm, talking about Walt, I'm talking about Walt. Yeah, old Walt. Like our the the, the poet the poet of contradiction. Walt Whitman, yeah. right? Well, does he contradict himself? He contradicts himself. He was large. He's bountiful. Like he he <laughs> he saw the the contradictions within himself and owns that he is a worker. Right. Of course. There's there's. And he wasn't going to go around saying I'm a gay. <laughs> uh, right. Radical. Right. He hit it as best he could, but he was he was attacked for being gay. Mm -hmm. right. He mm -hmm. lived that contradiction yeah. between his sexual um, proclivities and his public persona. Yeah. When people read Leaves of Grass, mm. which I did at the age of, I don't know, 14, one didn't have the impression that I was reading the work of a uh, gay man. Uh, maybe I wasn't reading it carefully enough, but the truth <laughs> of the matter is that he didn't acknowledge his sexuality. Hmm. There's some description of some muscles. Sorry? There's some muscles. There's some description of some sailors there. Yeah, a bit. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's hard crane too, but but you know maybe I'm thinking of well, of hard crane, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all part of the look. I think, but I don't want to get away from your question. But I just I think, but I think it seems relevant to this idea of the thought and the essence. Like the the so, the, so there's this the the poet that is working all day because. Of, he has to, you know, live a material existence, but also there's also this metaphysical larger question about crossing the, the, the waterfront. You know, they're taking the Brooklyn Ferry and looking at the water, and, and I think, I think what we're trying to say, is there a way to, to live a life that, uh, that is free? And is that possible within, you know, consumer capitalism? And I mean, and that's, it, or it is, I wouldn't say Whitman's thought precludes 
positive and negative thinking. I think that I think it's possible, but maybe I'm. I mean, and I think I think that's what he's he's suggesting is that there are ways out. There are ways to have both. Well, yeah, and there's ways, yeah. But the problem is, or the ultimate point for him is that no one can escape within the framework of capitalist society. No one can escape living a dialectical existence, and the dialectical existence is not merely one of development. It's a, it's a contradiction. Mm -hmm. In this country, to be a, te a teacher of college students in 2020, 2019, 2080, uh, uh, 2018, etc., um, you have to have a PhD. There's no law of nature that would argue effectively that a PhD equals wisdom, either as a teacher or as a uh, uh, researcher. It's a bureaucratic phenomenon to which anyone who aspires to being a full-time writer has to consider because writing freelance is not a lucrative right. pursuit, <laughs> generally. If you really want to be a free, a free person, relatively speaking, because you still have to deal with the publishers, um, you do not take academic jobs. You do not take secure jobs, except maybe as a, as a uh, low-level um, health worker or low-level clerical worker in the health industry or in bureaucracies. You know, you don't take any responsibility, you don't make a living. And it's a real problem. I wanted a right. And I looked around, I was tired of union organizing because I was beginning to develop my critique of the labor movement. And so I was not going to quit my job in the labor movement for another job in the labor movement because they were all pretty close together. Like one or two exceptions at the local level and in certain respects the international offshore and warehouse movement. Um, so I decided on the academy. But what I did also decide on was not to go back to school to try to get a job without a real, a prestigious degree. And I lucked out. I had written some pieces for the nation and other places. And it's on the basis of those pieces that I got a baccalaureate at the new school and admission to that graduate school, which I stayed in for less than one year. <laughs> I couldn't take it. <laughs> <laughs> what were you gonna say, Margaret? Oh, I, I know the experience. <laughs> what? I know the experience getting yeah. a little bored with the new school. But I was thinking about cracks in society. Are there you have to speak a little cracks louder. in society? Uh, you were talking about work, and uh, there's a flooding of podcasters and people kind of making their own uh, digital, selling their own digital personas and avatars, everything all over. Not that it makes money, but. I'm just wondering, um, mainly because of surveillance capitalism and the digital life literally uh, taking over everything, uh, even above and beyond government and bureaucracy. So uh, how this is uh, getting to leveling everyone 
and uh, producing some inhibitions even. I just, that's why I was wondering about the idea of, there used to be an, an idea of cracks in society. I don't know if that, I mean, I can't even imagine different Sorry. forms of it existing now, although I might be able to argue some. I think the gardens, when, they, when, 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 when there's a crack on the sidewalk and, 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 and uh, a you weed grows little, up, the, the weed, weed is trying to out. say, fuck you, car. Yes, you know, like, it is. Screw That's you. Like, uh, you know, like, we could be a green space. This could be an urban space yeah. that, you know, like, I, and I, I, all the sidewalks on my block are all cracked and there are weeds growing and I love it. You know, like, oh. I, you know, they're... There possibility that guy has alive and you know could take over. Yes, you know? that's why I brought it up. Right. So you know, I, I would like to say something. I am I am passionate about it. I, there is a beautiful song by Leonard Cohen, one of yeah. my favorite singers. Yeah, yeah, me too. It says uh, there is a crack in everything. everything. Oh, yeah, 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 I get yeah. sick. Yeah. yeah, I was I I spent that. Uh, well, I have been working for several years now with undocumented workers in in in, in Canada, and one of the things that I have learned there is that. When people, one of the spaces that were, where I found cracks in the system, a, a kind of a refusal, is when people work together in cooperative labor, and when people don't are not subjected to, to the wage labor slavery. Uh, of course, you know people sometimes uh, can produce things together and they have to sell it. It's a, it's a market, and you yeah. have, you have you are governed by the market, but you are not subjected to the discipline, the, the labor time discipline. Uh, to, to somebody who, you know, to govern your life because of, the, uh, of this. And so there's a partial emancipation from the slavery of wage labor. And I find that those cracks can be expanded by promoting the, or creating cooperatives. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'm interested on, the, on, on this, the, those ways out. And I have a question for you, uh, Maestro Stanley. Uh, there is a, there is a, uh, a when 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 uh, when uh, Marcus is talking about the the ways out at the very end of the chapter, he talks about the, the these pariahs of, of of late capitalism, no, and how it is important to create alliances to organize a great refusal, a refusal that uh, that is trying to overcome uh, the domination and to implant reason and with it freedom. But you have a theory about social movements. It's a theory that, that, that uh, I, I see if I understood well your work, it puts emphasis on, on how people can overcome uh, the determination of class domination by organizing, by working together uh, in social movements. Let me intervene here. OK, sorry. I was an organizer for about seven years as a professional organizer, we're not, and I was in the it was in the um, uh, in the clothing industry to start with, and then in the mostly the chemical industry. And in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New Mexico, Canada, I, I was in all those places. Every good organizer starts with the search for the most intelligent and sometimes exemplary figures in that industrial workplace. They are already leaders. That is to say, other people talk about them as if they were people that they would trust. And so you try to get those people on the side of the union and have them do the organizing in the plant rather than you organizing in the plant. People, they, ha, have you seen Norma Ray? Yeah. Love it. Oh. Love it. Okay. You love it, okay. It's a very nice movie. Sal, Sally Field's yeah, the best. Yeah, yeah. And, and Sally Field is wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's interesting about Norma Ray to me is that the organizer Well, uh, the, the falsehood is that the organizer stood in front of the plant. That 
daily. That didn't help in the cell. Sorry. You got your head handed to you. Not at the, at the, at the uh, plant gate, but when you get back to the motel room, or your, or your car blows up. Yeah. But other than that, Sally Field plays Norma Ray, and he finds her, and she does a lot of the in-plant organizing. It's a little bit one-sided, but it is exemplary of what it is to be an organizer. You find Norma Ray's, and you work with them. And from them, you branch out. And the one thing I found that was interesting is that they shared a mimeograph machine where they uh, made leaflets, or flyers as they're now called. Um, I did not. I mean, that's the only way that it is successful. And other organizers in many unions, including the Oil Chemical Union and the Clothing Union, they try to organize the plant themselves and they almost invariably fail. They don't look for the key, key people through whom they want to convince people about the union. Um, and that's what, that's what you are saying. You gotta find the people who are who are alive and are thinking and are receptive. The informal networks. What? The informal networks where the people talk network. and you'll find yeah. you'll yeah. find that some of the people you want are at first suspicious, never hostile, but always suspicious yeah, of, of who Good you reason. are. And what you have to do in order to be able to organize. Yeah. Hmm. So Eli you was. Give, you don't give up. When they say no. On um, negative or neutral responses, you have to keep uh, keep digging. And if you don't have time to dig, you you rarely will organize. You have to do it slow. And lots of union uh, leadership don't have time to let their organizers spend the time that it takes to organize the union of a plan. I just have a comment about something Marcuse does not really seem to discuss much, but has to do with unions. It's the way in which the, the court, at least in this country, the courts have been so complicit, you know, especially the Supreme Court, in creating this business managerial mindset that has deprived unions. I mean, this doesn't just occur naturally through technology. It's through concerted effort by especially the Supreme Court, which is, has really yeah. made it much harder for unions to organize. I mean, the unions have been decimated, and I think that's also part of the judicial movement against you know, workers. And so this is, this is something that I think is worthy of, of at least mentioning. When you have a chance, don't go to elections because the company can either beat you in an election, which is not uncommon, or uh, you'll never get enough. Um, the company will beat you either in an election or take the case to court by filing an unfair labor practice against the union and tie the union up in court in relationship to that particular plant or workplace. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that you have to talk about openly, which is very hard for organizers to do, is the possibility of a strike or a slowdown. You never talk openly about sabotage. You can't do that. Although sabotage is not unusual, without a union or with a union. But um, you can't sabotage a court case. That's, that's true. I think that's what you're referring to. I mean, if there's a, a if, they, if there's a 
Jurita, if there's a legal attack well, on organizing. We're seeing this in Hong Kong right now, the yeah. country, which is, I lived in Hong Kong for 10, eight, seven, eight, 10 years, and you have no political freedom. The result, and you see it in this country too, is, to a lesser extent, is violence, whether That's it's right. through strikes or if it's uh, you know, out on the street, you go to the street. And in a way, the l lack of participation in the process here is, I think, moving us towards more of that kind of direct confrontation. But do you think, do you think, in the, in, with the response to the Janus decision, I think we're having to do more member organizing. We're having to actually really, I think the unions have to be much more accountable to membership because membership can walk away. No, oh, you mean the recent Supreme Court decision? Recent Supreme Court yeah, decision. I was right? very much against that. Right, yeah, of course. Yeah, we, I mean, everybody's yeah. against the Janus, but I mean, except for Gorsuch, you wanted the guy to die in the truck. You know, like, it, <laughs> don't die in the truck. You, don't, you know, like, uh, in, in, instead of, instead of, so, so um, I think, you think it, it still forces us to be accountable to each other. Yep. And maybe that's a possibility that we actually have to talk to each other and create the mutual aid networks that you're talking about. Like, actually people yep. helping each other out. Yeah. You know, I like looking out for each other, making sure nobody's fucked over, and right? This is, like, kind of, this is where I kind of fall yeah, into. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. right. Yeah. Groups, right. Yeah. Yeah. Talks, right? Yeah. This is where I kind of fall into total agreement with this idea of communism, as we'll see. Yeah. And there has been, at least in theor theory, in French theory, quite a bit of discussion about the idea of community mm -hmm. in the last 30 years. And I see that, yeah. and that's kind of where my passion is right now. But it's not something yeah. based on coercion. It would have to be something different. And I think there has to be something different. You know? Where's your passion? in this idea of rethinking community and tying it to freedom, as you kind of yeah. like mentioned. You seem to make that connection today. What How? does West Virginia and Oklahoma teach us? Oh, boy. <laughs> the the bureaucracy of the union <laughs> you can don't be an impediment need. to yeah. uh, actual right. organizing. Right. Right. Yeah. You don't True. always need a union right. to yeah. get action. You go wild, right. yeah. 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 And they didn't go, out, they won the strike, although it was a piss poor settlement. They won the strike because there was a freeze in West Virginia and Oklahoma, both places, again, by the governor, and the executive branch wouldn't yield, yield even the education. So they had to take direct action. Yeah. Which yeah. ultimately, rather than elections is the best way to organize mm -hmm. a workplace. How, what happens after the election, after the strike, if they don't form communities yeah. um, or don't rethink freedom? Mm -hmm. See, one way of rethinking freedom is to organize on the basis of a federation rather than a CIO top-down union. Yeah. A federation would be each workplace is, auto is autonomous mm -hmm. and they connect with each other uh, without necessarily forming a central um, office. Could you call that a coalition? No, the coalitions can have central offices. Oh, okay. hmm. What you call is federation. Okay. Hmm. The American Federation of Labor was originally established on the basis of not individual workplaces, but individual crafts coalesced with other individual crafts to form a unified uh, front against the industrial employers. Mm. Lost track of crops. <coughs> the anti became became, in, in some sense, a replica of the CIO, where it had central organizations, which um, dictated often what they allowed their affiliates to do, and certainly their organizers. And the Teamsters are a great exception. And the Teamsters are mm -hmm. that's mine. The, the Teamsters allow... Call from Hicksville and Y. Allow local unions to have their own organizing staff. Mm -hmm. 
Neuron or tower disorder as an alternative. Collective bargaining with big corporations, they're very centralized, like United Parcel Service. But they never organize FedEx. Yeah. Yeah. Because FedEx meets the, uh, the UPS standard. Yeah. And they and the team can have too narrow a conception of the labor movement to be able to apply for office. Once they said, you know, we are, we are competitive with the UPS and we don't have the union, mm -hmm. it's very hard to organize it unless you have an admiration. Like freedom, which the team just don't have. So I've been, I've been thinking a little, we, we had a nice, a good discussion I think, about constituent imagination versus constitutional imagination a few weeks ago with an Negri reading. And uh, for many years, you know, I mean, with Ludmilla and the Reclaim the Streets and the Global Justice Movement, I was a fan of Be Realistic, Dream the Impossible, the 1968 stuff. But now, as the years have gone on, it's sad. I have a friend that said, you, I, I feel like I've become constitutional. I think about wildcat strike, well, what would be the terror law violation, right? I, I think about that comes to mind. And, it, and because dream the impossible, but how far does it, you know, you have to dream and we need a poetic imagination, but it, there's also reality. And, and that's a, the reality principle looms. So, I, you know, wildcat strike can, if other members aren't in the union aren't involved, it can, they can still be punished if I'm not wrong. So it, it's true. So it's a, it's also a very dangerous thing to, you know. But it's always been dangerous. Right. No doubt. No, no. It was. It was just as dangerous when someone was going to lose their job and right. was supporting a family in a cold water flat. Yeah. I mean, I think it's always been dangerous. So I think the question is. Mm -hmm. Why does it feel more That's dangerous more. now? Right. Why does it feel more dangerous? Yeah. I mean, why are people like me, adjuncts, so scared mm -hmm. of losing their jobs? Yes, they're low paid. Yes, many have families. But why do we perceive it as being more threatening? The wildcat strikes, those aren't new. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. I was going to say, when you were talking before, people should read a liberal book that's quite good, Democracy in Chains. Yes. And they, yeah. she documents uh, the way the Koch brothers have been at the center of a very managed campaign to turn this country to neoliberalism, you know, against unions and so yeah. on. So, mm -hmm. so, yeah. uh, okay. Anyway, so, so I think when you say the question, I think of that, and I think because we know that job insecurity is greater, you know, that unions are weaker, that the culture it makes it harder in some respects to, to rebel, you know, in some ways it's... Rebellion is very much going on, but it's it's uh, what's the word separated. It's 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 disaggregated. It's yeah, but when you get a whole state like Oklahoma, a people going out on a market strike, somehow the Koch brothers missed that. They missed. Well, they tried to keep that from happening, but they, they right. couldn't do it. Yeah. 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 Um, we, there is no adequate response to the charge that if you go out on strike, or even if you intend to organize a union, you might get fired. Norma Ray got fired. Yeah. 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 Well, there's no adequate But response. she gets hired with another job. What you have to say is, how much always would you rather live in a, uh, in a situation of dependence where you have no Right. Freedom, no autonomy to make any of your own decisions. Or would you rather have a situation in which you and your fellow workers have begin to negotiate and to struggle for a different workplace? Well, where does that happen? And the answer was in Sweden. Volvo plants in Sweden was organized on the basis of uh, community, uh, uh, departments being communities of workers who manage their own um, work. And in Argentina, a little bit, right? Argentina, more than a little bit. Sweden has 9,000 people all together and <coughs> Two auto plants, a Saab and a Volvo plant, and a truck plant which belongs to Volvo, belonged to Volvo. 
it's much easier, but it's much more interesting that in Argentina, um, they organized 20,000 people into these autonomous organizations, which still exist, but have taken some hits. I just and I have other a question you take is marginality. I have a question because this brings back to Marcuse. I think he raised it in the first session, which is the idea that for Marcuse we've reached the stage with an advanced capitalism that we can solve the issue of necessity. So then but in a way I think that comment, although it seems to not speak to this current predicament, is actually very prescient. I, I think it really does speak because as a society we have achieved that level. And therefore, it's allowed capitalism to develop all these tools to delude us and mislead us. That's still there, but it doesn't resolve the fact of distribution and of inequality. But so, just because we've reached the stage, we all feel we live in a world of tremendous wealth. But Marcuse is not saying that this is a utopian experience for us. It's the opposite. Yeah. It's that we live in a world of tremendous necessity, which is created for capitalism to keep us working. Mm -hmm. So medical care is is geared towards your employment, and especially in America. And then, of course, we, all, we also have these Brave New World kind of tools to kind of keep us placated. So in a way, I see that as really actually quite addressing our own current predicament of the today, not 2019, yeah. without negating the real experiences of people who are struggling at the, at the precarious yeah. kind of situation. It used to be it wasn't long ago, it was about 40 years ago, maybe, when a, a country song, I'll keep this, take this job and shove it, <laughs> would be very, very powerful because people understood yeah. that if they lost one job, there was another right job yeah. someplace else. True. True. The problem is the creation of scarcity, which has gone along with the Koch brothers and others' strategy, has made keep us take this job and shove it with a relic. Yes. True. A nostalgic relic. Yeah. Yeah. People have hard time finding work now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And when they find it, it doesn't pay a living wage. And economists don't understand what's going on. Yeah. 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 Well, they do. They do. They do. <laughs> Why the wage is not. Spend, the people who are paying them. I see. I, I see. To, uh, I didn't go there, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't understand why wages haven't gone up uh, in the last. You know, well, some of them have the wrong theory. That's probably true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but crap donuts. Donuts. Okay. Uh, good. <laughs> I got to go see. Big love. Crap donuts. Thank you. Donuts. Donut? Give it to the kids. Can I, is it okay? Oh, yeah. oh no, no, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, no, I don't want to, without asking. Yeah, please, please, take it, take it. It's a very big up. Yeah, no, I mean, big love, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, bye. Check out. We can make this the last class, or we can have another class. Next week is Thanksgiving weekend. The following weekend is nothing. We can have a class. Do you want another class? Yeah. 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 Last chapter of. Um, I just can't make it next week. So what? No, it's the week after You're that. You're saying two yeah. weeks. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. I say two yeah. weeks. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Two yeah. weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Not meet next Saturday. But no. Two weeks. Yeah. yeah. Not Thanksgiving yeah. weekend. Finish the book, basically. Yeah. Finish. Yeah. The book. Everybody's too rich. <laughs> give us hope next class. You're going to give us hope. There's no hope. Well, that's what Jackers was about, I guess. I don't know.